June, 1944, D-Day. The ramp drops, signaling the start of an invasion that will determine the fate of the war. In the next hour, 8,000 American troops will hit the beach. Many in the first wave will die. But when the ramp drops, what emerges isn't an infantry platoon. It's a line of amphibious tanks. And the target of this D-Day isn't Normandy. It's Saipan. This series is brought to you by World of Tanks PC. Check out the game at the link below and use the invite code FORAGER for extra goodies. An engine roars. An amphibious vehicle lurches down the ramp and drops into the sea, chugging forward. It's slow and heavy, this converted transport. Light armor plates weigh it down, and a stubby 75mm cannon thrusts out of its open-topped turret. The crew looks back to see a line of their fellow landing vehicles, LVTs, plunging into the sea each time a wave swells beneath the landing ship. One misjudges and drives into a wave trough. It drops 20 feet and splashes down like a brick, sunk with all hands. The crew winces. Each vehicle has 24 men aboard. The Marines have nicknamed them Amtraks, amphibious tractors. Cannon-armed hardened Amtraks like the one this crew drives are an Am tank. The Am tank plows towards Saipan, churning the rough water. The crew sees flashes on the mountain, Japanese artillery. Shells throw water spouts 20 feet high. An LVT behind them disintegrates. Hold on! The driver screams. He downshifts. Treads bite coral, and the am tank lurches up on the reef. For a heart stopping moment, it feels like they'll go over backward. But then they're onto the shelf, moving faster but exposed. Mortars drop around them. Machine gun bullets ping off the front armor. The am tank next to them explodes. Then they drop into the calm lagoon. The crew clenches their teeth, thinking of what's ahead for the marines in the transport behind. First the beach, then the brush. Then the towns, sugarcane fields, and caves. Only then could they climb that mountain and silence the artillery. The fighting was expected to be so close, some marines were carrying shotguns. The Amtrak transports are supposed to advance a thousand yards inland today. But for that to happen, the lead Am tanks need to assault the enemy emplacements on the beach. They begin to fire. The crew hears the shifting grind of sand. The am tank lurches onto the shore and up to the tree line. Machine gun bullets ping its turret armor and zip through the hull. The gunner rotates the turret and answers with a shell, cracking the pillbox open. He glimpses a Japanese light tank through the trees, then the nose of the am tank plunges forward. Stuck. Its rear in the air. An anti-tank ditch. The crew grabs their rifles and bails. From now on, they're infantry. For the first time in the war, Americans have landed on Japanese soil. This battle would decide the fate of the Pacific War. That's what they'd been told in the briefing, and it was no lie. Saipan was the most heavily fortified of the Northern Mariana Islands and had been Japanese territory since 1919. But it wasn't the island's sugarcane industry America was after. It was their airfields. Because a B-29 superfortress launched from Saipan could strike the Japanese homeland, opening it to the kind of sustained strategic bombing that was currently pounding Germany. And so, the U.S. had sent an enormous fleet to invade an island that was only 12 miles long and five across. And on the other side of the beaches, concealed in brush, emplacements, and caves, the soldiers of the Imperial Japanese Army and Navy knew exactly why these Americans had come. Their commander, Lieutenant General Saito Yoshitsugu, had made that clear. Saipan was home soil for them, for some quite literally. Soldiers that spent time there tended to marry into the Japanese settler families, and even those whose families lay far away in Japan knew that this battle was to defend their loved ones from American bombs. But they're understrengthed and under-equipped. American submarines had sunk whole convoys full of reinforcements, weapons, and construction materials meant to harden Saipan. But that was too late to worry about now. Now their plan is to attack. Pound these marines with artillery, then counterattack and push them into the sea. If that failed, they would go inland and defend every inch of ground to the death. The second marine division is doing badly. Japanese artillery had waited until the Marines, disordered by currents and incoming fire, had stacked up on the congested shore before opening up. Their thin-skinned Amtraks have turned into easy targets, and some have abandoned them even before reaching shore. 
Units are disoriented and mixed together. Japanese snipers kill officers left and right. By the end of the day, five of the seven battalions in the 2nd Marines have lost their commander. Some units suffer 35% casualties. Swamped in blood, flying sand, and burning tanks, Marines form ad hoc fire teams to push forward into the machine gun and sniper fire. They scratch foxholes in the sand to shield themselves from mortars. Between them, AM tanks duel with Japanese Type 95s. Then, the counterthrust hits their lines. Down the coast, the 4th Marines are doing better. Their landings haven't stacked up, and Amtraks are able to push hundreds of yards inland. Some stop to evacuate native Chamorro Islanders. But the narrow roads force the Amtraks and Amtanks to drive single file. Easy prey for artillery, tanks, and mortars. Lines of burning Amtraks choke the roads as they make their way towards the sugar-refining town of Chiran, Kanoa. By nightfall, it's clear no one will make their first day objective. The Marines have taken over 2,000 casualties by sundown. Over 20 Amtraks have gone down in the assault, with one armored platoon suffering 40% losses. The Marines begin a fitful night, each two-man foxhole team taking turns napping while the other watches for the black-painted infiltrators that sometimes slip behind the lines with knives. They're awakened by a scream. Bonsai! Bonsai! General Saito's counterattack has arrived. Soldiers charge out of the darkness, waving swords and firing pistols and submachine guns. Some leap into marine foxholes, guns blazing and bayonets fixed. Japanese tanks rev towards the beachhead. Machine gunners decimate the incoming attackers. The USS California, wounded at Pearl Harbor, drops artillery in support. The Marines repulse the charge under the white glow of naval star shells. 700 Japanese soldiers die in the determined but futile assault. With that, D-Day ended on Saipan. But despite the brutality of the first day's fighting, 20,000 Marines are now ashore. Some of them are code talkers, Navajo radio men recruited off the reservations who speak an unbreakable cipher based on their own language. Throughout the battle, they'll help direct naval gunfire and relay secret orders. And crucially, the Shermans arrive. Throughout the second day, the tanks pushed forward, neutralizing artillery encampments and machine guns, though not without losses. When one Sherman was immobilized, its commander, Gunnery Sergeant Robert McCard, remained inside directing fire. Nearly overrun, he ordered his crew to evacuate. He lobbed grenades to cover their retreat, then dismounted with the tank's machine gun to hold off the oncoming attack. He received a posthumous Medal of Honor. By the end of day two, there had been hard progress, and the exhausted Americans settled in for another watchful night. Then, at 0330, the Marines heard engines. The men of the Imperial Japanese Army's 9th Tank Regiment raced down from the foothills of the mountain. They've received an order from Tokyo. The fate of the Japanese Empire rests in their hands. They must destroy the enemy. Their commander has promised to defend this bulwark of the Pacific if it costs 10,000 deaths. And so the 9th Regiment has scratched up every tank it can find to drive a wedge in the American beachhead. 37 tanks, Type 97 mediums in the lead, Type 95s follow. Infantry squads ride on their backs and charge behind. They power forward into U.S. machine gun and artillery fire, running directly over Marine foxholes and in among their lines. But the 6th Marines are ready. They survived a tank assault the night before. Fearing it would happen again, they requested backup. Shermans and half-tracks surge forward to meet the attack. Cannons light up the night. But the infantry will decide this battle. As the first Type 97 runs over a Marine foxhole, the men inside duck as it passes overhead, then emerge with the long tube of a bazooka. They put a round in its weak rear armor. When it slews to a stop, flaming, they hunt for another target. Marine bazookas fire point-blank, holding tanks with each round. The line descends into anarchy as armor, infantry, and artillery fight a 360-degree brawl, lit by the fires of burning vehicles. And as each wave of tanks goes down, more emerge from the shadows. Confused by the smoke and the swirl of combat, Japanese crews keep opening their hatches to get their bearings. When they do, Marines leap onto the tanks, shooting the exposed men and shoving incendiary grenades into the open hatches. Within 45 minutes, the 6th Marines have destroyed 24 tanks, with five others falling to neighboring units. 
as the sun begins to rise, they realize they've just stopped the largest Japanese tank assault of the war and wiped out the majority of Imperial armor on Saipan. But there was no celebration. The next morning, the Marines pushed forward again, through waist-deep swamps and cane fields. They entered the shell-wrecked town of Charan Kanoa, fighting house to house, shotgun against bayonet. And the next morning, they looked back to find an empty ocean. The Navy was gone. Rumors spread that the fleet had abandoned them. Now it was just two armies fighting chest to chest on an island five miles wide. Once again, big thanks to everyone at World of Tanks PC for sponsoring this episode. If you think that looks as awesome as I do, check out the game at the link below and use the invite code FORAGER for extra goodies. Tell them extra credit sent you.